Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. Daria walked briskly down the corridor of the main office of Okaja Bank. The employees of the financial institution he encountered respectfully made way and greeted their boss. However, the banker didn't pay attention to any of them. He stormed into the reception area, and the secretary immediately abandoned her tasks. Dario, someone from Asabathel called for you. It can wait, summon Gomez. Tell him it's urgent. The secretary prepared to respond to her boss, but he was already in his office. He casually tossed his coat and scarf onto the couch, upholstered in ivory-colored leather. He settled into the armchair and sat there pensively, staring at the painting on the wall. Then, he rubbed his cleanly shaved nape with his palm. Yes, it's beautiful and very eerie at the same time. The office door creaked open, and the secretary hesitantly poked her head in. Mr. Gomez has arrived. Let him in. Adriana left, and in her place, the head of security appeared in the doorway. Dario critically surveyed the well-trained figure of the chief security officer and uttered with undisguised mockery. Mr. Gomez, what kind of people you have here? Confidence quickly evaporated from Gomez, and this instant change in demeanor didn't escape the boss's notice. Leonardo, did you have a sudden spasm in one place? From your well-fed face, I can tell I guessed right. And I'll tell you that part of your body reacted appropriately, sensing in advance what awaits its master. Dario, I don't understand what you're talking about. Dario slowly rose, and his powerful figure loomed over the desk. It's all about the same thing, Leonardo. You've been doing poorly with your direct responsibilities. And tell me, what's the point of having such a security service if your staff does nothing all day long? Leonardo blinked frequently and constantly swallowed saliva. The banker glared angrily at his subordinate and flicked a glass of delicate glass. The strike was pinpoint accurate, causing the vessel to move, just in front of Leonardo. Thank you. The head of security nervously took the decanter in his trembling hand, while Dario watched him with a sly grin. Be careful not to spill it, Dario said mockingly. Leonardo emptied the glass cautiously and placed it back on the tray. He stood there, shifting his weight from one foot to another, unable to sit on the chair without the owner's permission. Dario enjoyed watching his subordinate's agony and finally took pity. All right, have a seat. Thank you, Dario. I can't stand it when people start talking about something in vain. It makes me want to kick those deceitful sycophants in the side. And do you know why I always feel that way? I don't know, Dario. Because I hate those who demean themselves. But I, Dario. Don't explain, Leonardo, I know everything. You are just like most of the people who work here. All of you are willing to crawl and lick my boots, but when something happens, you'll be the first ones to betray me. That's the kind of human treachery I can't stand the most. Leonardo, be a man, look up and look at me. The man complied with the boss's demand. In a trainer-like manner, Dario loudly commanded. Now tell me why I still don't have the materials I asked you to get on this table? Are you talking about Perez? Dario, give it two or three more days, and all the necessary information will be on your desk. My team is on the trail of this person. Don't boast. It doesn't impress me. I need specifics and strictly business-related. Yes, I understand. I'm waiting for a report from my man who's tracking Perez. The delay occurred because your late father's former comrade changed his personal information, and it took us some time to figure out who is who. Leonardo stood up but hesitated to leave because he was waiting for an order out of habit. Dario looked at his subordinate with contempt. You can go. After the head of security left, Dario pressed a button on the selector. Adriana, tell everyone that I'm not available today. The banker walked behind the bookshelf which concealed the doors to a small windowless room. This secret room served several purposes. Dario enjoyed spending time here, and not infrequently, he did so with company. 
but the main purpose of the room was to house the most important documents in a safe equipped with the latest security system. He had a similar hiding place at his country house. Dario entered the code, then placed his large thumb on a small screen, and the metal cabinet door silently swung open. The safe was nearly empty, only a few slim folders with documents and two packs of foreign currency meagerly lay on the shelves. Dario took out one folder, from which some old black and white photographs spilled onto the floor. He gently picked up one snapshot and caressed it with a trembling hand. Father. If you only knew how much I miss you. Dario's childhood had no notable events, so he barely remembered that period, and he had practically forgotten his mother as well. Sometimes, a vague image of a constantly silent woman who flinched at every loud sound would surface in his memory. His father relished the sight of his fearful wife and enjoyed repeating, Are you trembling? That means you respect your husband. That's good. He would even instruct his little son, barely out of diapers, build character and never listen to women. They're only good for one thing, but I won't tell you what that is until you're older. Dario soaked up every word his father said and tried to do everything as he was told. However, Marcos didn't instill a Spartan spirit only in his family but also in his work. Many were afraid of his tough character. When the factory switched from producing dump trucks to frying pans and teapots, Marcos realized that something needed to change urgently in his life. He decided to venture into commercial activities. He immediately found a like-minded companion, his college friend, Felipe Perez. Ten-year-old Dario immediately liked this cheerful and even adventurous person. Handing him an expensive gift, Uncle Felipe said, Dario, soon you'll have a cool car and a villa outside the city. Of course, Dario wasn't present during the secret meetings of the two companions, but the boy had an excellent hearing. He was also very astute for his ten years and easily understood that his friends were involved in some shady business. True, Uncle Felipe referred to their idea as the a project of the century. Soon, his father had so much money that he started splurging left and right. Dario enjoyed wearing designer clothes. His classmates couldn't take their admiring eyes off him, and the girls even competed for the chance to sit next to Dario at the same desk. The final scene of their sudden enrichment was the family's move to the capital. However, this joyous event was marred by one unpleasant episode. Once, some guys burst into their apartment and started rummaging through all the cabinets, but his father remained calm during the nighttime intrusion. Not a single muscle twitched on his face. Gentlemen detectives, what are you looking for? One of the visitors, apparently the leader, demanded from his father, Dario, you know perfectly well what we're looking for. Hand it over, or you'll be in prison for a long time. I don't understand you. I'm an honest businessman, and yet you aggressively intrude on me. I'll complain. It's your right, complain. If you allow me, I'll make a call. After all, I'm not arrested, which means I have the right to a phone call. The main detective yanked the cord out of the landline phone and chuckled. Go ahead, call if you can. Father looked at him as if he were crazy and pulled out a mobile phone from his inner pocket. At that time, such devices were rare, and the detective turned green with anger. Marcos spoke only a few words into the receiver. Diego, they've come after me. Handle it. The detective's reaction to the call left them shocked, and they quickly left the apartment without finding what they were looking for. Dario was intrigued by the incident, but his father only smiled mysteriously and told him not to worry. Little did Dario know that his father had connections that ran deep and far-reaching. Then he handed the phone back to the leader. It was evident that the man had received instructions from higher-ups, and the entire team quickly left the apartment. Just as Dario had managed to fall asleep after the unexpected commotion, a scandal erupted in the house. His father was yelling at his mother, I won't tolerate a traitor in my own home. It's because of you that they turned everything upside down here. Did you blab something about me to your little brother? Through tears, the mother pleaded with her husband, Marcos, I swear it wasn't me. Emilio never asked me about your work but they wouldn't have found out so easily that Felipe and I made deals using dummy identities. Marcos, I don't understand anything about your business. 
Emilio only said something once about how you became rich too quickly, that's all. He also asked me which company you work for, but I don't even know the name. I told him you're in construction. Go to your brother and your ugly family. You think just because you married me, you'd live your whole life without denying yourself anything? No, my dear, your fairy tale is over. Marcos, what about Dario? I won't leave without him. Our son will stay with me, and that's not up for discussion. Tomorrow, I'll instruct my lawyers to begin divorce proceedings. And if you try to interfere, you know what I'll do to you. Don't awaken the beast in me. I'll allow you occasional visits with Dario if you behave well." The mother cried and mumbled something in response, but Dario couldn't make out the words. Of course, he could have stood up for his mom, but he didn't want to. At 13 years old, he already understood that his father could provide him with much more than a frightened woman who had ironically become his mother. When Dario woke up in the morning, his father told him, Mom won't be living with us anymore. Dad, I heard everything. That's good. Of course, I'm not a beast, and I'll give you the choice. If you want, I can take you to your mother today. Dario didn't need time to think. He answered with adult seriousness, Dad, I want to stay with you. Soon they moved to the capital. At first, Dario still occasionally remembered his mother, but gradually her image faded from the teenager's mind. This process was facilitated by forgetfulness and Clara's own indifference. Apparently, her maternal attachment was so weak that she never once expressed a desire to see her son. Later, Dario learned from his father that his mother had remarried, and she had children from her second marriage. Of course, deep down, there was a sense of resentment towards his mother, but Dario tried not to dwell on the past. However, city life quickly lured the teenager into its whirlwind. His father enrolled him in a school attended by the children of the new elite, in the morning, Marcos's personal driver took him to the educational institution, and in the evening, his father picked him up. The glamorous lifestyle was picking up speed rapidly, but unexpectedly, Dario almost lost it all. One day, his father returned home very late and began to destroy things. Scum, a betrayer. I trusted him, and he betrayed me. Dario was starting to grasp his father's business, so he asked. Dad, why are you causing this chaos? Oh son, better stay quiet. Intervening slightly sobered up Marcos. He stopped damaging the property in the house. The next day, unfamiliar people flocked to their place, and his father stayed in his office until late in the evening. When he finished with the important matters, his face wasn't as angry as the day before. Don't worry, Dario, everything will change. Felipe thinks he's smarter than everyone else, but his pathological self-confidence will lead him to his downfall one day. Father remained silent for a while. Dario understood that he was deciding how much of the truth he could share with his son. Marcos's contemplation didn't last long. He offered his son a seat at the table, and Dario knew that such an honor was only reserved for a select few. His father was never verbose, and this time was no exception. Son, there will come a day when I will initiate you into the intricacies of our business. For now, I can only say one thing, never trust even the closest people, as it may result in a downfall. He deceived me like a fool. Thankfully, I had suspected his dishonesty beforehand and managed to create a safety net. Otherwise, you and I would be standing with outstretched hands at the train station right now. His father delivered this conclusion in a tone that made it clear that questioning him about the details of what happened would be futile. From that day on, Felipe's name was never mentioned in their home again. The businessman's only son was also part of this restricted circle and, therefore, couldn't enjoy privileges based solely on his status. Marcos would often jokingly say, As long as I'm alive, I'll be training you. Certainly, here is the translation of the text while preserving the meaning. Of course, such an address outraged the self-respecting young man. And one day, he couldn't hold back. Dad, but I'm not a tiger. Don't be upset with your father. I'm trying to instill an iron character in you so that no one can break through that armor. At first, Dario tried to resist his parents' method of toughening his character, and the rebellion of the young man once led to a serious conflict. 
In the final year of college, Dario fell head over heels in love with a girl who worked as a saleswoman in a flower shop. But when his father learned about his son's secret romance, Dario, don't even dream about it. I won't allow my only son to marry some pauper. The young man almost lunged at his parent with his fists. Don't you dare speak like that about the girl I love. And you won't stop me, father. I. I'd rather leave home than follow your unhealthy whims. Well then, get lost. Just like your mother. Spineless, just like her. You're free to do what you like, but remember, I'll never bless such an unequal marriage. In the old days, there was a good tradition. Parental blessing was a mandatory condition for marriage. It's a pity that this rule is not practiced today. His father turned his back on Dario, signifying the end of the conversation. The young man was still boiling with righteous anger, but he vowed to himself to follow what his heart told him. In this resolute mood, he showed up at the flower shop, but was told that his beloved was no longer working there. The young man went to the girl's address and ran into her in the hallway. Elvira, where are you going? The girl averted her eyes and quickly said, Dario, I urgently need to go home. My mom is sick. But you'll come back, won't you? I don't know. Tell me what happened. Why didn't you even warn me? That's how it has to be. Dario, please, don't ask me anymore. But can I at least see you off? The girl flinched. No. No. I'll manage on my own. A taxi should be here any moment. Elvira hurried out onto the street. Dario had the impression that his beloved girl was running away from someone. It took him five minutes of contemplation to figure out who had interfered in their relationship. His father was at home, and Dario stormed at him. Dad, I didn't expect such treachery from you. Son, what are you talking about? Did you threaten Elvira? I simply offered her a small sum in exchange for a little favor, and the girl understood everything right away. She agreed to disappear from your life forever. Dario was shocked by this revelation. Are you saying that Elvira took the money? Alas, yes, that's the case. I must admit, she hesitated for a while, but not for long. Girls from poor families find it very hard to resist. Especially when there's a thick stack of bills in an envelope. Father, you're just a monster. And what's wrong with that? Personally, I see nothing wrong with it, and I consider your comparison a compliment. Believe me, within a month, you'll be thanking me for not allowing you to make a wrong move. At that time, Dario was deeply offended by his father and even moved to a rented apartment. For a whole month, Marcos kept a distance, but then he showed up at his son's rented residence. The banker carelessly tossed the keys with a keychain onto the table. These are the keys to your apartment. It's not fitting for a banker's son to live in a rented place. My driver will take you to your new residence. I don't need your handouts. I can manage without them. Listen, Dario, I'm tired of your tantrums. You behave like a child. But I can't tolerate your antics indefinitely. I have a serious business, and your behavior is tarnishing my business reputation. Don't test my patience. The banker's voice once again carried the familiar ominous undertones. With horror, Dario thought that his father wouldn't even hesitate to eliminate him as an irritating factor if the need arose. With trembling hands, he reached for the keys, and Marcos approvingly remarked. That's the way to go. The apartment is excellent. I'm sure you'll like it, and your girls will be delighted too. But Marcos couldn't bring himself to tell his son the main thing. Dario, you're already grown up, and you'll understand me. Don't rush into marriage. Girls will go to any lengths to catch a desirable groom. I also fell into that trap in my time, and as a result, I was left with nothing. Are you talking about your affair with mom? Marcos sighed heavily. There was no affair. At least not on my part. Yes, I was liked by Clara, and she was willing to do anything, but my position didn't allow for unnecessary gossip and rumors. Father, I understand you. 
You married like an honorable man, finding out about mom's pregnancy. Is that right? Well, you know, now I don't regret it because I have you. You have no idea how much I love you. It was a cry from the heart. Marcos had never allowed himself such vulnerability before. Dario noticed a tear glistening in his father's eyes and rushed to him. Dad, I understand everything. Forgive me if I offended you in any way. I love you very, very much too. Dario, I've wanted to show you the place where our roots come from for a long time. As soon as we have a couple of free days, we'll definitely go to our ancestral home. The house that my grandfather built with his own hands is still standing. I wanted to sell it, but then I changed my mind. Why have you never told me about the inheritance before? I don't know why. My mind is occupied with business, intrigues, and competitors' schemes. I have to be able to respond to all these challenges. The joint trip to the village that his father had longed for was constantly postponed. And after Marcos introduced his son to the management apparatus, Dario forgot about that conversation with his father. Just as the young heir was getting settled in his new business, the main tragedy of his life occurred, his father died. Marcos seemed to have foreseen the misfortune. Just a day before, he called his son. Dario, come urgently. We need to discuss something. The young man didn't ask unnecessary questions and immediately went to the main office, but he didn't find his father in the office. The secretary reported, Marcos asked me to tell you that he'll be busy today. He'll wait for you tomorrow morning at the same time. Annoyed, Dario left the reception area and headed for the exit. But the secretary caught up with him halfway. Dario, you left so quickly. Marcos, when he was leaving, asked you to take this folder. He said you need to review the documents by tomorrow morning. However, the scheduled meeting never took place. Dario learned about his father's death from the morning news summary. The attractive anchor reported indifferently, this morning, at 7.40, the well-known banker Marcos Gonzalez was killed. The investigative authorities have not yet released details of the incident. Dario immediately rushed to the place where the dreadful crime had been committed. The banker had a bulletproof car, and evidently, the assailants were aware of this when planning the attack. His father and two bodyguards were attacked at the moment they were ascending the steps of the office building. Only the driver was left alive, but he couldn't provide any coherent information. When the deceased son arrived, the investigative team was already on site. Dario ran to his father's car, but a man held him back. Dario, accept my condolences. The young man looked around. Where is my father? His body was taken away. You understand, an examination is needed but there are reasons to believe that a professional was involved. Dario couldn't recover from this loss for over a year. When his mind cleared a bit from emotions, he started pondering intensely about what had happened. It took him a while to remember the folder that his father had passed to him through the secretary. After studying the documents that had come into his hands, Dario concluded, through simple analysis, that people close to the banker were involved in his father's death. Dario decided to act tough. He hired a whole team of private detectives who eagerly started searching for the mastermind behind the brutal crime. They found the perpetrator, or rather, his body was retrieved from the river two days after the high-profile incident. Soon, the detectives closed in on the trail of the mastermind, but the difficulty lay in the fact that the trail led to a country overseas. Dario easily deduced that Perez had decided to eliminate his former friend. This suspicion stunned the air. So this is the enigmatic Uncle Felipe. But never mind, I will get to you. I'll get to you, and you will surely understand that you can't mess with us like that. Dario started devising a plan for revenge. At the same time, he understood that he might not have enough time to carry out the vendetta. He focused on this problem for several days until a bright idea illuminated him. He had to strengthen security measures, and he had to do it lightning fast. Moreover, on all fronts. During just one working day, Dario restructured all the old staff and assembled a new team. He was particularly meticulous when selecting personnel for the security department. 
The only person he kept from his father's staff was Leonardo Gomez, Marcos Gonzalez's driver. Dario invited the man for a serious conversation. Leonardo, my father spoke highly of your professional qualities. I hope you won't disappoint me either. Gomez stood at attention. You can fully rely on me. Great, your responsibilities will change a bit. Now you'll be my eyes and ears. Of course, sometimes I'll give you specific assignments. I understand completely, Dario. I am fine with these conditions. That's excellent. For now, focus on recruiting personnel for your department. I won't interfere in this process, as I consider you a professional. However, when selecting candidates, thoroughly investigate all their relatives and review their resumes. I understand, Dario. Gomez eagerly took up the task, and soon, the first positive results of his work emerged. In one of the subsidiary branches of Akaja, a group of employees was identified, regularly siphoning company money into offshore accounts. Upon learning about this behind his back, Dario demanded the head of the security service, bring these scoundrels to me. Leonardo grinned strangely and quietly suggested, Dario, why waste precious time? Maybe we can just quietly get rid of them? The banker looked at the head of security in a way that made him sit down. Leonardo, consider that I never heard this. I understand, boss. The trio vanished without a trace, and such cases were not repeated. After sorting out some matters, Dario decided to visit the village. The local elder had been looking after the house all these years. Judging by the satisfied look of this elderly, yet still vigorous man, Dario realized that he was receiving quite a decent payment for his effortless service. As if reading his thoughts, the elder boldly stated. Consider that I've been looking after your property for a year for free. One question, what do I need all this for? I also have to risk my life because suspicious characters occasionally come here. For instance, just recently, there was an incident. Two guys in a fancy car rolled up. I'm not too savvy about foreign brands, but I knew it was an expensive car. Expensive car, but these two guys had faces like criminals. Dario tensed, awaiting the climax of the story, but the elder didn't rush. He clearly enjoyed the attention to his person. I asked them what their purpose was. They laughed at me so hard that shivers ran down my spine. They said, looking me straight in the eyes, that those who want to know too much don't live long. And who were they looking for, after all? Nobody. There are only three cripples left in our village. They have nothing to take except for their medical records. They were interested in your house. They asked me directly, where is Gonzalez's house? Dario felt a cold chill inside. Did you show them? Of course, I showed them, for a small fee. They gave me thirty dollars, and I showed them a house. The elder rolled his eyes to emphasize the importance of the moment. But it wasn't your house, it was someone else's. We have plenty of empty houses here, they can pick any. Dario understood and took out one hundred dollars. The elder man licked his parched lips. Thank you, sir. But it's not enough, the man said. Dario pulled out another $300, causing the man to jump in place. When you're done, you'll bring the keys back to me, the man added. Dario took the heavy bunch of keys and headed towards the house. He had never been here before, and he was amazed by the interior of the old house. Woven rugs on the bare floor and icons in the red corner made him feel like he had teleported into the past. He thought he might have to spend the night here since the examination would take a lot of time. However, besides the antique furniture and religious icons, there was nothing valuable in the house. All the drawers and hangers in the closet were empty. Only on a shelf did Dario find a stack of old photographs and a pile of notes. Glancing briefly at the discovery, the banker whispered, seems like exactly what I need. Well done, father, you even foresaw your own accidental death. The next morning, Dario gave one of the photos to his head of security. Leonardo, we need to find this guy. Can you at least give me a general idea of where to look? Leonardo asked. 
You're asking me, Leonardo? You could look for him on Mars for all I care. By the way, is this the person who hired your father? Dario didn't reveal to Leonardo that he now had documents shedding light on events from 20 years ago. After some thought, he handed over another photo, which depicted a happy couple. On the back of the photo, written in calligraphy, were the words, in memory of Marcos, from the future newlyweds. Leonardo glanced briefly at the photo. Dario, this is the same guy as in the first photo. I'm interested in the woman. Find out everything you can about her. The investigation that had started vigorously suddenly hit a dead end. At first glance, Dario realized that the case had come to a standstill. Still, he asked with feigned indifference, how is your investigation progressing, Leonardo? You could say it's finished. And I mean finished in all directions, Leonardo replied. Can you elaborate? Dario inquired. Of course. All right, here's the deal. Felipe Perez died less than a month ago. But my guys tracked down his lawyer and found some very interesting details. Turns out this guy swindled a huge sum of money from your father and fled to the States. There, he thrived, and at the time of his death, his capital amounted to a substantial sum with six zeros at the end. Plus, he had real estate. In short, it's all serious. When he learned about his terminal diagnosis, he wanted to come to Spain, but he got scared. Your late father set up networks for him in such a way that he wouldn't have escaped that easily. Gomez paused, and the young banker continued for him. And to remove the obstacle, he ordered my father's murder. Yes, Dario. It all makes sense, but precious time was wasted, and the client himself soon bid farewell to his life. But Felipe left a will for his offspring. So, this very lawyer is now searching for heirs in Spain. Does Perez have children? Well, this is where it gets really interesting, Dario. There is every reason to believe that the lovely woman in the photo was pregnant with Perez's child. But that's not surprising, considering he fled the country a week before his own wedding. And he bequeathed everything to his child? No, most likely, he left everything to his grandson or granddaughter. But don't worry, we haven't reached that point yet. I found this woman in the photo. She has a daughter, 21 years old, a college student, still unmarried. But there's one more amazing detail. The faces you're interested in still reside in the town where you grew up. Thank you, Leonardo. Your team did a great job. Will there be further instructions? Not for now. Although, find out more details about this woman, Perez's daughter. Dario didn't hesitate for long. Gomez's proposal allowed him to solve two issues at once, transition from search to action and getting to know the girl better. The next morning, he delegated his tasks to his deputy and set off on a journey to Zaragoza, the provincial town nearby. The students were already tired of the rector's tedious speech. Some were glancing at their watches, while others were chatting without hesitation. Finally, the bell rang, and everyone rushed towards the exit. Eva was the first to dash out of the classroom and headed for the stairs. Estella struggled to keep up with her. Eva, where are you rushing off to? Wait, I need to tell you something, Estella said. Estella, I don't have time. Exams are coming, and I'm not prepared at all. You're not the only one. I haven't even opened a single smart book yet. Estella tried to match her friend's pace but couldn't do it right away. Eva, I would gladly go to the library with you, but I'm just not in the mood today. But I promise, starting from tomorrow, I'll start studying. Then, see you tomorrow. Eva, wait. One minute won't change anything. You distracted me from something important with your library talk. Okay, I'm listening. You have one minute. Try to make it quick. Just give me a moment to catch my breath. Estella, come on, faster. We'll be together all day, and you could have told me earlier what's bothering you. It's not about me, Eva. It concerns you. Fine, at your request, I'll get straight to the point. 
I can't stand watching you toy with Federico. Eva, I've asked you a hundred and one times not to meddle in my private life. I care deeply for Federico. He's my best friend, but nothing more. Federico didn't ask me to do this. I did it on my own initiative because I can't bear to see you torment the guy. Eva was offended, don't you think you're taking too much upon yourself? Estella let out a frustrated sound but decided to confront her friend, it's disgusting to watch you. You're pretending to be something you're not. Estella, do you want to argue with me? I know all my flaws perfectly well, but you can't control your heart. I can't force myself to love Federico. Eva clacked her stylish boot heels while Estella remained in the same spot. She angrily flicked a pebble into the bushes and headed quickly towards the bus stop. Estella imagined herself passing by her friend without even looking her way, relishing her revenge. However, she couldn't enjoy it because she noticed Eva talking to a respectable-looking stranger. In five steps, Estella covered the distance to where the scene was unfolding. She overheard the stranger offering Eva a ride in his car. Eva, don't get in. He'll take you to the woods and then your body will be found in the spring, Estella warned. The man chuckled, is this your friend? A fun girl. Where did you come from, and why are you bothering girls? Estella questioned. Oh, I deliberately came to your little town to meet lively girls like you. By the way, this is the city of my childhood. I was born and raised here, and I even wanted to attend the university. Have you already spilled everything to him? Eva also laughed. I had no idea such a specialization even existed. And I assure you, your friend didn't share any secrets with me. Listen, girls, you're so entertaining, but I'm very hungry after a long journey. Would you keep me company? Eva was about to decline, but Estella spoke before her, of course, we're ready to help a guest in our city, but show us your passport first. Estella, you can't do that, Eva protested. The man calmly took out his documents, you know, Eva, your friend is right. Vigilance is never superfluous, especially when dealing with strangers. I hope you'll show me the best restaurant in town. Estella carefully studied the stranger's passport, Gonzalez Dario, not even married. The banker smiled sheepishly, didn't have time, lots of work, no time to think about myself. I run one of the largest banks in the country. Estella continued to assess him with a scrutinizing gaze, yes, it's the first time I'm talking to someone so important. Eva, everyone will be amazed tomorrow when they find out we met a real banker. Let's go, I'll show you the best restaurant, Eva said. The banker played along with the girl. So, Estella, are you ready to be my guide for the evening? Excellent. But we won't go on foot, we'll go by car. Deal, he said. Instead of answering, the girls got into the banker's car. They didn't notice that a young guy was keenly observing their swift departure from the bus stop. Federico studied at the same university but in a different faculty. He had planned to have a serious talk with Eva today, but he didn't get the chance. As the Gonzalez's car pulled away from the parking lot, Federico automatically glanced at the license plate and involuntarily whistled. Wow. A guy from the capital. What brought him here, he wondered. A bus arrived, and Federico jumped onto the back platform. The black SUV haunted him all evening. Later, he grew worried about Eva and decided to call her. However, her phone was switched off. He then called Eva's mother. Rose, is Eva home? Can I talk to her for a minute? No, Federico. She's still at the library. It's almost 10 p.m., is the library open that late? Not wanting to let Eva down, he lied, I'm not sure, but I think the reading hall now works until midnight. Don't worry, Rose, Eva will be home soon. Federico decided not to call Eva again. I'll talk to her tomorrow. With that thought, he fell asleep, but in the morning, he overslept and even arrived late for his first class. Throughout the day, they crossed paths with Eva in the corridor, but neither of them felt like engaging in small talk. Federico tried to reassure himself again. I'll leave early after the last class and meet her on the street. 
this plan only partially succeeded. Federico left the university earlier, positioned himself in a secluded corner of the park, but Eva passed him by. He watched her as she got into the car. It was the same SUV from yesterday. Federico turned abruptly and saw Estella. She was looking at him sadly. Federico, you don't stand a chance. You're a student, and he's a banker. Yesterday, he took us to a restaurant. He's loaded with money. Can't you see the difference, she said. Federico remained silent. He turned sharply and hurried to the bus stop. Estella watched him for a long moment. Days flew by, and Eva changed. She became distant from her old friends, and she simply avoided meeting with Federico. Rose observed her daughter with concern but didn't know how to start a serious conversation with her. One evening, Eva was getting ready for a date and twirling in front of the mirror in a new dress. Mum, help me choose an accessory for this dress. I think this pendant won't look too flashy, she said. Eva took out a box from her purse, and her mother gasped when she saw the expensive piece of jewelry. Did your banker give you this? Rose asked. Eva nodded affirmatively, and her mother continued her advice. Eva, why do you accept such gifts? You know you'll have to pay for it, right? Eva protested, Mom, what are you talking about? Dario gave me this trinket from the bottom of his heart, and he's not asking for anything in return. Rose sat down on a chair, Eva, are you really naive or pretending to be? Why did you get involved with an older man? He's almost old enough to be your father. So what? Eva retorted. He'll still leave you. Mom, don't measure everyone by your own experiences. If you had a bad experience, don't project it onto others. Instead of being happy for me, you're making up nonsense. Eva, it's not nonsense. You'll ruin your life, and it will be hard to mend. He's not the right match for you, this banker. You'd be better off with Federico. Mom, I just don't love Federico. And you love this man? Eva dreamily rolled her eyes and twirled around the room. I've never felt so light. When Dario is with me, it feels like I'm floating on a cloud. And I want this fairy tale to never end. Rose watched her daughter, and her heart squeezed with a bad premonition. However, she understood that her daughter was genuinely in love with the man who had suddenly entered their peaceful life. In just a month, Eva's life had dramatically changed. She often caught herself thinking that all of this was happening in a dream, and she feared waking up. She didn't want to go back to the dull and monotonous life, so she ignored her mother's complaints and her friend's disapproval. During one of Estella's attempts to bring her back to reality, Eva said with undisguised arrogance, Estella, you're just jealous. Soon, Dario and I will get married and move to the capital. And you'll stay here in this dreary town, where soon only old people and dogs will walk the streets. Eva, you're blinded by your illusory happiness. Can't you see that your banker is not the person he pretends to be? His eyes are wicked and cold, Estella argued. Estella, it's all in your imagination. Dario is extraordinary, he's kind and caring. He's willing to do anything for me. Estella realized that she wouldn't be able to change her friend's mind. Even though it seemed almost impossible to fix the situation, she asked, tell me when the wedding is. I hope you won't forget to invite your friends. The smile vanished from Eva's face. What a silly question. Where would I find another friend like you? Dario and I haven't decided on the place yet, where our wedding will take place. To clarify these important details, Eva turned to her future husband, Dario, the wedding is only a few days away, and you haven't told me anything. What exactly do you want to know, he asked. Well, where and how will we celebrate this event? Dario didn't want to torment his bride-to-be and confessed that he decided to register their marriage at the local registry office. Eva, it will be more convenient this way, as we won't have to wait for the mandatory three months. I've already made arrangements with the head of the office. Next Saturday, we will become lawful spouses, he explained. Eva showered her beloved's face with kisses in delight. Dario, you are amazing. 
We'll sign the papers and then go to the restaurant? The one where we had dinner on our first date. Am I right? Eva said, her arms still wrapped around him. We won't go to the restaurant, Dario replied. Then tell me where our wedding celebration will be, Eva asked, still hugging him, but Dario gently pushed her away. We won't have a wedding, he stated. Why? Eva thought her beloved was just joking, but Dario was serious. Her continuous questions were starting to irritate him. Eva, I believe we don't need a noisy celebration. We'll sign the papers and immediately head to one of the most incredible places on the planet, Thailand. I've been there once before, and believe me, it's one of the most breathtaking places on earth. Only there can you see the stars bathing in the ocean at night. Eva was afraid to breathe too loudly. She already pictured this magical island and couldn't wait to go there. The wedding and all its conventions had become secondary. The next day, she excitedly told her friend about the planned honeymoon. Estella interrupted her, Eva, wait, what about the wedding? Dario thinks it's better for us to celebrate the wedding just the two of us. I also believe it's better to go straight to the honeymoon than sit at a table, surrounded by a crowd," Eva replied. Estella slapped her on the shoulder, hurt. Enough, you can stop now. I understand everything, and I'll tell the others. Goodbye, my friend. Estella walked away briskly, not looking back. Eva shrugged, well, Dario is right. We should know how to get rid of old and unnecessary connections. Rose was also in a state of shock when she learned from her daughter that the wedding was cancelled. She looked at Eva with wide eyes but couldn't utter a word. Later, she sadly remarked, how easily you let go of your friends. I wonder, will you do the same with me? No, no, mom. Dario allowed me to invite you to the registry office. He said that parents should be present at this important moment, Eva explained. Dario allowed, Dario said. Eva, wake up, shake off this delusion. Even the best husband shouldn't dictate your life. If your banker is setting conditions now, think about what will come next. Rose pleaded. Mom, everything will be fine, Eva reassured her. Eva grabbed her mother's hands, wanting to dance happily together, but Rose forcefully pushed her away. Without saying a word, the woman retreated to the kitchen. There, she cried until evening, but Eva never once checked on her or inquired about how her mother was feeling. The girl was happy and didn't want to cloud her joy with her mother's discontent. Eva slept for almost a day after returning from her honeymoon. She didn't want to open her eyes yet, wishing to linger a bit longer in the magical world of blissful dreams. However, somewhere nearby, a monotonous sound persisted and drilled into her brain. Who has nothing better to do? Will this go on indefinitely, she thought. Stretching, she got out of bed and walked to the window. In the lawn right in front of the house, an unfamiliar man was fussing near the gazebo. From behind, a voice spoke, that's our gardener, Isidro, he decided to repair the bench. Eva startled, as she hadn't heard the unfamiliar woman enter the bedroom. The woman wasn't bothered by Eva's surprise and decided to introduce herself. You came back quite late yesterday, so we didn't have a chance to meet. My name is Maria, and you can come to me for anything, she said. Eva couldn't figure out who this woman was, suddenly appearing in the marital bedroom. Are you Dario's sister? Maria smiled forcedly. No, Dario doesn't have any siblings. I am the housekeeper. Oh, and I had no idea my husband keeps household staff. Eva, breakfast is ready, called Dario from the other room. The girl didn't get a chance to say she wasn't particularly hungry when an elegant trolley entered the room. Maria spoke in a lecturing tone, in this house, everyone follows a well-established routine, and you should also remember the meal schedule. But it's not difficult. She placed the tray on the bedside table. Bon appétit. Eva enjoyed a couple of fresh toasts and sipped a cup of aromatic coffee. Now I can head to the university. They probably thought I was lost. I can just imagine the rector's face when he sees me. But where is my suitcase? Once again, the housekeeper emerged from nowhere. 
All your belongings are in the closet. While you were resting, I organized everything, she said. The girl interrupted the servant indignantly, I can't stand it when others rummage through my things. And tell me, dear Maria, do you do this regularly? Maria asked, what do you mean? Do you appear unexpectedly? Or do you keep an eye on me? Dario instructed me to assist you until you settle in. So, I try to be around, Maria explained. Please, I urge you not to be too eager. Instead, could you tell me where the bus stop is around here? There is no stop nearby. You have to walk about two kilometers to the nearest village, replied Maria. Eva put on her coat and grabbed her purse. We'll see each other later, Maria. It was nice meeting you. Likewise, Maria responded. The housekeeper stood on the stairs, observing the new mistress with a mysterious expression on her face. Eva hurried out to the porch and was heading towards the exit, but Leonardo, her husband's driver, blocked her way. She immediately disliked this unpleasant man, and apparently, he felt the same about her. He scrutinized the young wife from head to toe and muttered through clenched teeth, Eva, please go back inside. Eva tried to go around him. What's with these silly games? And who are you to order me around? Leonardo maintained the same steady voice, saying, this is not a game, but an order from the master. No one can enter or leave the premises without his permission. But I need to go to the university. Do I need special permission for that too? Yes, I'm sorry, that's the protocol. Please return to the house. Eva had to comply with the driver's demand, but her heart was boiling with indignation. She couldn't wait for her husband's return, and without any preamble, she confronted him. Dario, explain to me what's going on here? Am I your wife or a prisoner? Why does your dim-witted driver boss me around, and why does this unpleasant character constantly linger outside our bedroom door? Let's discuss everything right away so that you won't have any problems in the future, Dario replied. Dario, what are you talking about? I am a free woman and can do whatever I think is necessary. First, calm down, and second, I make all the decisions in this house, and I advise you to remember that. Dario, what are you saying? I'm not your servant, I'm your wife, and I have the right. He cut her off abruptly, your main duty is to make my life pleasant, so try not to ruin my mood. And I want to remind you that you'll have to end your relationships with old friends and acquaintances. But what about my studies? I'm in my final year. Take an academic leave for a year. We'll see how things go from there. Dario, why do you decide everything for me? Because I'm your husband, and let's end it here. You can still meet with your mother, but I need to know about your meetings in advance. Leonardo will bring Rose here, and you can have a talk. With that, Dario left the young wife and headed to his office. Eva remained in a state of shock for some time, trying to understand what had just happened. But she realized only one thing, the fairy tale had ended, and all her dreams shattered like a broken mirror. Late autumn wasn't generous with gifts, but the townspeople rejoiced in this sunny day at the end of November. The sky was blue like in summer, and the sun bestowed its invigorating warmth upon the earth. However, Federico paid no attention to the beautiful weather or the cheerful faces of people passing by. For almost two months, he had been in some kind of limbo. Until the last moment, he couldn't believe that Eva would marry the city banker. He hoped she would wake up at the last minute and remember the one who truly loved her. But the miracle didn't happen. On Eva's wedding day, he and Estella watched everything from afar. Rose refused to go to the registry office. Federico, I'm afraid I won't be able to handle it and will create a scene there. I never thought I'd live to see the day when my only daughter would be ashamed of me. But if Eva has decided that way, I won't ruin her celebration. For her happiness, I'm willing to set aside my pride. Besides, I am capable of many other things. Federico also burned with the desire to tell that arrogant banker to his face what he thought of him. But Estella warned him. Federico, don't even try. Can't you see how much security they have there? These tough guys could beat you up. And there's no need for unnecessary casualties. 
The friends waited until the newlyweds came out of the registry office and got into the car. Estella sighed. Rose said they're leaving right after the ceremony. Eva mentioned something about an island. They plan to spend their honeymoon there. Federico looked pleadingly at his friend. Estella, please, spare me the details. Federico, I didn't realize it would be hard for you. The rejected admirer felt a physical pain throughout his body. He wanted to vent his accumulated negativity and headed to the nearest bar. Estella tried to follow him, but he asked her, Estella, don't take it personally, but I need some time alone now. I'll definitely call you in a few days. However, Estella never received the promised call, and she didn't call him either. In university, they hardly saw each other either because Federico immersed himself in preparing for his diploma defense. He also avoided meeting Estella because her presence reminded him of his failed love. At first, Federico tried to find solace in drinking, but his cousin Jose wouldn't allow it. In the early days, after the love disaster, Federico got quite drunk and caused a scene with the bartender, who refused to serve him. He grabbed the bar employee by the shirt and shook him. Who do you think you're refusing? I'll tear you apart on this table like I'm cutting cabbage. The bar administrator didn't wait for the heavily intoxicated customer to carry out his threat and called the police. Federico spent several hours behind bars until Jose showed up. He didn't choose polite words. Listen, bro, I'm warning you for the first and last time. If something like this happens again, I'll personally arrange a trip for you to a rehab center. And after your stay there, there won't be anything decent waiting for you. Did I make myself clear? Federico mumbled, yes, I understand. I promise it won't happen again. Jose spoke more amicably, everyone experiences ups and downs in life, but resorting to extremes, especially for a guy, is the last thing to do. So, turn the page and start fresh. Federico tried to follow his older brother's advice. He focused on preparing for his diploma defense and rarely went out. However, on that November day, he had an important errand in the city, and the sunny weather had a positive effect on him, making him decide to take a leisurely walk seeing happy faces around him, an optimistic thought crossed his mind, maybe someone else is rejoicing. Perhaps a bright streak will come back into my life too? Lost in these pleasant thoughts, he straightened his shoulders and stopped at a pedestrian crossing. Suddenly, a black SUV slammed on the brakes next to him. Out of habit, Federico photographed the license plate, then continued walking to the other side of the street. However, halfway through, his memory kicked in. It was the same car. Eva might be in it. He rushed back, but the SUV was already far away. His mind raced, and soon it suggested the only right solution. He needed to turn to Jose for help he would definitely assist in figuring out where the banker goes. That would lead them to Eva's location. Not wanting to waste time, Federico called his brother beforehand. Listen, I need your help. Jose sighed, is it urgent? I'm a little busy right now. No, it's not urgent. I can come by when it's convenient for you. All right, then drop by my place in the evening. We can talk there. At the appointed time, Federico went to visit his cousin. Jose hadn't started a family yet, so he lived in a dormitory. He met Federico on the ground floor to prevent him from getting lost in the maze of corridors. When they found themselves in a small room with just enough space for a sofa and a table, Jose said, All right, brother, spill it. It took Federico only two minutes to explain the gist of his matter. Jose seemed disappointed, is that all? Yeah. And you dragged yourself across the whole city for this? You set up this meeting. I thought you'd bring something more interesting. This is just a mundane thing. Well, I'll try to gather some information tomorrow morning. I'll call you. But Jose didn't keep his promise, and the entire next day, he didn't get in touch. Only late in the evening, he finally called. If you're not too busy, come over, there's something to talk about. Federico arrived at the dormitory 15 minutes later. Jose was frying potatoes in the kitchen. You rushed here quite early. 
My dish isn't ready yet. You'll have to wait a bit. I'm not in a hurry. So, tell me, what did you find out about the car? We can talk in the room, there are too many ears around here. Federico looked around. Jose, you're starting to see ghosts. No, I'm not hallucinating yet. But extra caution won't hurt. It's part of my job. A couple more minutes, and we can sit at the table. Go to the room, slice the bread, no need to stand idle. The brothers quickly finished their meal, and Jose said with satisfaction, Now we can talk. So, the situation is as follows, the vehicle is registered to Gonzalez Dario, which means your acquaintance, the banker. He's not my acquaintance. That's not important. And don't interrupt me. Go ahead. Gonzalez has a vacation house or cottage nearby. I don't even know which word fits better to describe this property occupying almost 15 hectares. I've never been there myself, but some guys from our department have been keeping an eye on your banker. Jose, he's not mine. Don't nitpick with words. And what's next? That's basically it. We couldn't dig up much about this Gonzalez. But intuition tells me that behind the facade of an upright banker lies a dishonest person. His father was also involved in major schemes. He got killed a year and a half ago, and, by genre rules, all the business transferred to his son. Various small things have come up within our radar, but we still haven't been able to reach Gonzalez directly. Not yet. Great. I asked you to find an address from a license plate, and you got so much information. Jose smirked, that's not all. There's something else I can't tell you since you're an outsider. I can only hint that Gonzalez's late father was involved in shady dealings about 25 years ago. He had a partner, and together, they pulled off numerous schemes, stealing the last pennies from so many fellow citizens. And was it difficult to catch them? Very difficult. They worked cleverly, leaving no evidence. But, as per the genre's rules, when two cockroaches end up in the same bank, one of them must become the prey of the other. That's what happened to the pair of swindlers. One eliminated the other and quietly fled to the States. And that's where it ended? Of course not. Where have you seen honest criminals? Tell me, will this information help you? Definitely. Now I know where that scoundrel is hiding Eva. Jose shook his head sorrowfully, you're back to your old ways. As a friend and a brother, I wouldn't advise you to make unnecessary moves. Why? Federico, it's one thing to be involved with a girl, but it's entirely different to trail after another man's wife. Your banker has some guards who can seriously hurt you. I'll be careful. It was already dark when Federico was getting ready to go home. Jose accompanied him outside. Brother, seriously, be cautious. If anything happens, call me. Maybe you'll spot something suspicious. Deal. Jose's story awakened the detective spirit in Federico, and the next morning, he asked his father for the keys to the car and headed to the village where Gonzalez's house was located. However, his joy was premature, as it had already snowed, and against the backdrop of white, his black coat made him an easy target. He had to return to the city and postpone the surveillance to the next day. For three weeks, Eva sat alone in the enormous house. She had already explored every corner of it, and it no longer impressed her. With each passing day, she felt overwhelmed by sadness. Rose visited once, but their meeting was brief as Maria didn't leave them alone. Maria's audacious behavior surprised Eva's mother, and she couldn't contain her outrage. Eva, I wouldn't be surprised if your husband soon orders you to wear shackles. Later that evening, the payment for her mother's bold statement followed. An infuriated Dario burst into the room and shouted, If your mother says something like that about me again, I'll put an end to your dates. Eva timidly interjected, Dario, my mother didn't say anything bad about you. She was just joking, and your Maria misunderstood it all. Don't consider yourself smarter than others. Dario stormed out of the room, and Eva burst into tears. 
In these few weeks of married life, she had forgotten how to laugh and couldn't bring herself to assert her right to freedom of movement. Most of the day, she spent by the window, watching Isidro clear the snow from the park paths. A few times, with Maria's permission, she went for a walk, although it felt humiliating. Maria, can I go for a walk? I feel dizzy from being cooped up. The housemaid looked down on her young mistress and, with a patronizing tone, said, Eva, besides fresh air, a young woman needs a high-calorie diet. And you haven't been eating well lately. If this continues, I'll have to report it to Dario. Eva was surprised, excuse me, but how does my appetite relate to my husband? I mean, to his feelings toward me? Now it was Maria's turn to be surprised, you're asking very foolish questions. Dario needs a healthy air, and I've been strictly instructed to monitor your diet and daily routine. Eva shouted back, what child? I'm not planning to become a mother yet. And nobody's asking you. The prolonged apathy was replaced by a surge of aggression in Eva. She desperately wanted to spit in the face of the hated housemaid or break the expensive vase in the living room. But she forced herself to control her emotions with sheer willpower. Putting on warm Uggs and a fur coat, Eva rushed out into the courtyard. Snowflakes danced slowly in the air before landing on her face and melting away. She twirled on the lawn. If a miracle happened and any flying craft, even a UFO, came to pick me up, I wouldn't stay here for a second. Isidro looked around and then said softly, not all desires should be spoken aloud. Remember, miss, there are ears and eyes everywhere. He gave Eva a meaningful look, and she understood his hint. Putting on a deliberately cheerful expression, she said, I'll take a walk. I want to sit by the pond for a while. Go ahead. I've already cleared the path there. Eva strolled slowly along the path to the farthest part of the estate. She felt someone's malevolent gaze on her back and turned around abruptly. Leonardo and Maria were standing side by side on the grand porch. She whispered, the overseers are staring, and they don't even seem embarrassed. During her short walk, Eva carefully surveyed her surroundings. She counted over a dozen cameras installed only along this route. She knew about the video surveillance in the house, but she hadn't expected surveillance devices to be scattered throughout the entire property. A playful thought crossed her mind. With determination, she could create a detailed plan and mark the blind spots. Federico had told her about the peculiarities of video monitoring long ago. He specialized in that area during his studies, and his lessons had stuck with Eva. She mentally thanked her friend. If I go for a walk every day, I can handle this task in a week. Perhaps having a new goal or simply the fresh air awakened her appetite. Eva ate every last crumb of the food Maria brought her. After a day filled with small but pleasant events, she fell asleep quickly. Suddenly, she woke up with a sudden bout of nausea and barely made it to the bathroom in time. After vomiting, she briefly felt relieved, but then the queasiness returned. Dario was already hurrying to work when Eva stopped him. Dario, I urgently need to go to the pharmacy. The man stared at her with suspicion. And for what reason is such urgency? Tell me why it's necessary, and Leonardo will bring everything, he said. I don't want your driver to buy it for me, she replied. The banker smirked. Can we skip the riddles? It's uncomfortable for me to talk about such things in front of strangers, Dario. Eva knew well that besides the camera, Maria was monitoring her every move and word. She asked her husband, lean closer, I'll tell you something quietly. Eva whispered a few words, and the banker broke into a smile. My dear girl, you've pleased me today. I'll tell Leonardo to take you wherever you want. Being mindful of the housekeeper's watchfulness, Eva grabbed her cell phone and locked herself in the bathroom. She had used this tactic before, attempting to contact Estella, but her friend didn't respond. So, she quickly composed a short message and deleted it right after sending. Soon, in a few minutes, the girl congratulated herself on her foresight. In her haste, she had forgotten to take her wallet and cell phone. Only on the street did she realize the absence of these important items, and she returned to the room. There, Eva caught Maria red-handed, going through her phone. 
Upon seeing the host's wife, she nonchalantly handed back the cell phone. You forgot this. I know. Did you find anything interesting in my phone? The housekeeper said nothing. For nearly a month, Eva hadn't left the city and relished the familiar scenery like a child. At the city limits, Leonardo asked, Which pharmacy are you going to? There's one in the center, next to a clothing store. I need to look for some household items, she said. I don't know about any store. The boss only mentioned the pharmacy. Leonardo, why are you so stubborn? Dario was in a hurry, and I just didn't have a chance to ask him. I'm trying to save fuel so I don't have to come back to the city tomorrow. If the boss says so, then I'll go. Eva stepped out of the pharmacy while the security guard remained by the car. The store was sparsely populated, but she quickly spotted Estella sitting at a table with a pamphlet in her hand. Eva stood in line at the ready-made medicine section and then sat on a nearby sofa on the opposite side. Estella didn't even glance in her direction, so Eva moved closer. In a hushed tone not to attract attention from other visitors, she whispered. Hey, friend. Thanks for coming. I couldn't ignore your call for help, replied Estella. Eva understood the hint. Estella, I'm sorry for hurting you and Federico. You were right. It seems I've gotten myself into a mess, and I won't be able to get out of it without some outside assistance. Without looking up, Estella said, I saw your companion. He looks like a hound on a scent. Estella, my husband keeps me in a cage. Cameras everywhere, and the housekeeper follows me everywhere. We'll figure something out, Federico and I. The woman in front of Eva finished her purchase and she hurried to the counter. At that moment, Leonardo entered the pharmacy, but Estella was already standing at the other end of the hall. On her way back home for the first time in many months, Eva felt a sense of calm in her soul. She settled in the back seat and almost immediately noticed a dark car following them at a slight distance. A surge of electricity shot through her mind. That's the same car as Federico's father's. This meant Estella was telling the truth, and help was nearby. Federico was pleased with the results of his observations. When he set up his post in the woods that morning, he never expected such luck. Encouraged by his success, Federico returned home, hoping to continue monitoring the Gonzalez's house tomorrow. Upon learning about his young wife's pregnancy, Dario drastically changed his attitude towards her. He became more attentive and immediately lifted several restrictions. But the most significant achievement was allowing her to go out of the house anytime she wanted. Eva decided to use this relaxation of the rules wisely. Several times a day, she went out for walks and thoroughly explored the most remote corners. Initially, her supervisors closely watched her movements, but then they let the process go on its own. Eva noticed that Isidro was also observing her. One day, she gathered the courage to have an honest conversation with him. Did my husband also instruct you to watch over me? Heaven forbid I stoop so low. I just feel so sorry for you. You're so young and yet trapped in a real hell. Eva became alert. What do you mean, she asked. You figure it out for yourself, and then you'll understand, replied Isidro. Footsteps were heard in the distance, and Isidro quickly went about his business, looking around. Following the advice of the old gardener, Eva turned into an investigator herself. She began eavesdropping on her husband's conversations with frequent guests in their home, and one day she overheard a conversation between her husband and his associate, Luca. Dario, I transferred the money for the last batch, but the supplier has increased the prices. And there have been more and more problems with transportation. Luca, you know how to persuade. I don't have any spare money right now, and I can't take any from the bank. Dario, come up with something. You're good at finding solutions, even in the most hopeless situations. I've already found a solution, but we need to wait a little bit. How long? About seven months. That's too long. The boss threatened to find another distribution channel. Tell him the money will be there. It will be there for sure. All right, I'll try to convince him. 
The men continued discussing some other matters, but Eva hurried to get away, not wanting her husband to catch her eavesdropping. The whole evening she tried to understand what Dario was so carefully hiding from her. A few days after accidentally overhearing the conversation, Eva had to go to the city again. She had an appointment at the women's clinic. The day before, following her usual method, she secretly messaged Estella, arranging a meeting place. However, Estella wasn't there on the first floor of the medical facility, which disappointed Eva. She went to the doctor's appointment, and then proceeded to the lab to get some tests done. The laboratory was in a different building, and to get there, she had to go through a long gallery with busy two-way traffic. Eva didn't immediately notice the woman following her at a distance. It was only when she heard a familiar voice say, Hey, ma'am, could you slow down a bit? Eva realized that Estella was tailing her. I don't want to run into your guard. He's hanging around near the registration desk. I wonder if he managed to sneak into the gynecologist's office and is still hiding behind a chair there. The girls burst into laughter. Eva complimented her friend, Leonardo really looks like a well-fed dog. Eva, let's not waste time. Tell me the news, Estella urged. Nothing special has come up, except for the conversation I accidentally overheard. You know, it just dawned on me. My husband is used to commanding everyone, but when Luca appears in our house as his so-called companion, Dario immediately becomes quiet. He tries to please Luca in everything. Too bad I don't have a photo. Luca visits us frequently. I'll take a picture of him and send it to you. Just be careful. Given your condition, playing detective might not be a good idea. I'll try not to take risks. And send my regards to Federico. Tell him his lessons have been very helpful to me. I wonder what lessons, Estella asked. I'll tell you later, when all of this is over, Eva replied. Once again, Eva was amazed at her friend's resourcefulness when she returned to the registration desk after getting her tests done. Leonardo seemed agitated, pacing the hallway and peering into visitors' faces. With undisguised malice, she called out to him, Leonardo, how long will you keep me waiting? The man froze in place and stammered, how did I not notice you? She really wanted to tell him that he's losing his touch, but she knew it was better not to provoke this unpleasant person. However, the desire to inconvenience Gomez was so strong that Eva almost found a reason to make another trip to the city every day. Dario couldn't refuse his wife, as he was concerned about her emotional state. During those days, another peculiar thing happened. The dark car followed them every day. Eva thought she should warn Federico not to take such risks. After all, Leonardo might notice the surveillance, and then all three of them would be in trouble. In the evening, she sent her friend a short message, but she almost got into trouble. Absorbed in her detective game, the girl didn't notice Maria's appearance. Who are you texting? Maria asked. Eva didn't lose her composure and replied immediately, to my mom. I hope I have the right to do that? The housekeeper looked flustered, her eyes darting around, trying to find solid ground. The girl decided to put this intrusive person in her place and pressed on, Maria, why are you snooping on everything? Did you even install a camera in the bathroom to monitor the frequency of my visits there? The housekeeper got flustered and quickly rushed out of the bedroom. Finally, Eva could breathe freely. She looked at the corner of the room where the camera's lens glinted and stuck her tongue out at the device. Eva had already assessed all the risks and decided that the safest place in the house was the bathroom. For several days, she locked herself in there to work on her plot plan. Eva had shown artistic talent since school, so this process was productive for her. However, instead of paper, she had to use a cloth napkin, which made the work a bit more difficult. After spending half an hour on the project, Eva hid the napkin. There was just a little left to do. She hadn't had the chance to survey the small area of land adjacent to the forest closely. After breakfast, she planned to head there, but unexpectedly, Isidro objected, You shouldn't go there. Eva was surprised. Why? What's there that I'm not allowed to see? The gardener looked at her with a familiar gaze, but remained silent. 
he strode toward the gazebo, and Eva hurried after him. Isidro, you didn't answer my question. The man exhaled, wiping the sweat off his face with his hat. Just like in an American movie. I'm tired of hiding from the cameras. He smiled bitterly. When I took this job, I never thought I'd end up in a military regime. Mr. Gonzalez has power over everyone. He gets a little better when that dark-skinned fellow comes to see him. Eva hinted, Luca? Probably him. I can't remember all of the owner's friends' names. It's quieter now, they used to leave the gates wide open before you came, Isidro said. Out of habit, the gardener glanced around and whispered, don't be mad at me for not letting you go there. There's a lot of snow, and the tracks will be visible. Tomorrow, I'll give you a tour of the secret door. Isidro, you knew all along, and you never said anything, Eva exclaimed. I didn't say anything because I didn't know what was on your mind. I rarely use that passage myself to keep my secret. The owner knows nothing about this door, but it might come in handy for you soon, Isidro replied. In the evening, Maria hurriedly prepared to leave. Eva, I hope you'll manage without me. I have some troubles at home, my father is sick. He's very old, you know. Don't worry, Maria. Go, take care of your things. I promise I won't run away while you're gone. During these months, it was the first time the housekeeper left Gonzalez's estate. Eva was surprised to see that the staff was using an expensive car. After Maria's departure, Eva decided to take a walk Isidro was already waiting for her near the gazebo. Let's go. While no one's around, I'll show you the secret paths. They walked for about 15 minutes until they reached a high fence. Eva remarked in amazement, I had no idea my husband's property was so vast. The gardener explained, the late Marcos personally acquired this place. In those troubled times, you could buy an entire forest if you had money. Besides this estate, he owned a lot of property abroad and even had his own plane. I suppose now the heir is in charge of everything. Isidro stopped and said, here's the door. Eva didn't immediately notice a small door in the solid iron fence. She tried to open it, and Isidro chuckled. It won't work without the key. The man took out a bunch of keys from his pocket. The door creaked open, revealing a breathtaking winter forest landscape. Eva exclaimed with admiration, what a beauty. Yes, it's beautiful, replied the man. He initially intended to hide the bunch of keys, but then changed his mind. He detached one key and said, this is a duplicate. I have my own key. Keep it, it might come in handy. It's about two kilometers straight from here to the main road. Thank you, Isidro. You're welcome. I really hope you won't have to use this key in an emergency. You're a good girl, kind-hearted. The old man hurried away and soon disappeared from Eva's sight. As the young woman rushed up to the porch, several cars arrived at the house. Dario warmly welcomed the guests inside. Eva, make sure our guests feel comfortable, he said. Sure, Dario, but Maria won't be here today. My dear, I know, she asked for two days off this morning. I hope you don't mind setting the table. Of course. Eva tried to fulfill her duties as a hospitable hostess quickly because she constantly felt Luca's unfriendly gaze on her. He thanked her, thank you, Eva. You can take a rest, and we'll handle things here. Dario, if you need my help. Don't worry, we'll manage on our own. Late into the night, the men discussed their matters. They spoke loudly, but Eva couldn't make out what they were talking about. However, she managed to take a photo of Luca when the guests went outside to smoke. It was still somewhat light, and the picture turned out clear. Eva was exhausted and fell asleep without noticing. Even in her dreams, she could hear men's voices, but suddenly everything fell silent. This eerie silence prompted her to get out from under the warm blanket. She put on a robe and went downstairs. There was no one in the living room. The cold air came in through the open door. Eva said softly, is it really so difficult to close the doors? She was about to head to her bedroom, but intuition urged her to go outside. 
Wrapped in her coat, she walked along the main alley and spotted a distant light. Her feet led Eva to the garage where the light was coming from. She had already thoroughly studied the security system and knew how to bypass it without getting caught on camera. As she approached the garage, the girl froze, trying to breathe quietly not to reveal her presence. She could hear male voices from inside, and Eva immediately recognized her husband's voice and Luca's. Luca asked Dario, Dario, the boss wanted me to tell you that he's ready to include you in the deal. What do you think about the offer? The estate's owner's response was instantaneous. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Tell him not to worry. My capital will double at least very soon. Luca laughed. Where does such confidence come from? Did your uncle die or something? Close enough. Not my uncle, but my wife's biological father. And what if your wife is against it? She won't be. Firstly, she knows nothing about the inheritance, and secondly, everything is arranged not in her name but in the name of the child she will give birth to. Dario, I knew you were a scoundrel, but I didn't think you were so heartless. You've cunningly thought it all out. Luca, it's easy to come up with a plan. The challenge lies in executing it. I've spent so much money and time to find Eva. Wait, but you'll have to get rid of her and the child to claim the inheritance. Dario, you're a complete villain. Luca, this world is held together by people like me. Just try to think less about it, and everything will be fine. Let's get out of here. The door slammed shut, and male laughter echoed. Eva couldn't move for a long time. She didn't want to believe what she had just heard. He wants to get rid of me and our child for the sake of some inheritance. What should I do? Despite the real threat to her life, Eva tried not to succumb to panic. Since Maria was not at home, she decided to call Estella. Locking herself in the bathroom, she spent about five minutes explaining to her friend what she accidentally found out. Then, she shivered under the covers, waiting for her husband's return. The subsequent days passed by in a haze. Eva tried to act as if nothing had happened, but it was a great struggle, and she knew her strength wouldn't last for long. Dario immediately noticed the change in the young woman's mood. He affectionately asked, Darling, you seem restless. Did something happen, or are you not feeling well? Yes, Dario, I'm feeling nauseous again, and I've been having frequent headaches. Why are we sitting at home then? We need to take you to the hospital right away. Let them examine you. Dario promptly called Gomez. Leonardo, we urgently need to take Eva to the hospital. Help her there, and make sure she doesn't wait in line. Eva heard this order, and her thoughts started spinning at triple speed. What should I do? How can I warn Estella not to be seen by Leonardo? They say that the brain works better in extreme situations, and it presented Eva with the only correct solution. Let her wait for you in the women's restroom. The girl quickly sent a message to her friend but was interrupted when Maria persistently knocked on the bathroom door. Eva, are you okay, in there? The irritation was so strong that it needed to be vented on someone. Maria was the perfect candidate. Eva knew she was hiding on the other side and abruptly swung the door open. Maria didn't have time to dodge and received a blow to the forehead for her carelessness. Eva relished the sight of humiliating this smug person. Maria, pregnant women often suffer from constipation. But I didn't think I had to explain this delicate problem to you, Eva said, while the housekeeper was still holding her forehead, prompting Eva to deliver another blow. And here's another useful piece of advice, when eavesdropping, one must observe safety techniques. The visit to the women's consultation room was brief, but Leonardo steadfastly followed the host's wife. After the doctor's examination, Eva intentionally led him through the corridors for a while, then suddenly disappeared behind the door of the women's restroom. There, Estella was already waiting for her. Why did it take so long? I thought you wouldn't come, Estella said. That security guard keeps following me, I could barely shake him off, replied Eva. The girls giggled a bit and parted ways. Before leaving, Eva asked, I sent you Luca's photo. 
Yes, I received it and immediately sent it to Federico. I wanted to take the site plan with me. It's all detailed there. But Maria tightened the control, now she monitors how many minutes I spend in the restroom and for what purpose. Eva, when will this nightmare end? I think it will be soon. But we shouldn't rush because one wrong move can ruin everything. When it's all over, write a book about your incredible marriage. I'm sure it will become a bestseller. Better not to jinx it. Oh, I almost forgot. Let mom know that tomorrow is her birthday. Estella widened her eyes. Isn't Rose born in May? Eva gave her friend a meaningful look. My husband doesn't know this fact from mom's biography. I'll ask Leonardo to buy flowers and hide the site plan in the bouquet. Eva, hurry up. The more you told me, the creepier it gets. It's like a real thriller. I never thought I'd become a participant in such a dangerous adventure. Don't worry, I'm completely safe until the baby is born. The expectant mother said this with such confidence, unaware that her husband had prepared a new surprise for her. When Eva returned from the women's consultation, Dario announced, Darling, you don't take care of yourself at all. And it affects our baby's health. I thought about it and decided that you need to spend some time in the clinic. There, you'll be under the care of the best doctors and won't worry about trivial things. Dario, but I'm perfectly fine. The doctor said there's no reason to worry. The man gave his wife a stern look. See, you're worried. We'll come back to this issue later. The clinic I arranged with doesn't have available spots yet, but I advise you to prepare yourself in advance. Okay, Dario. I'll try. By the way, can I meet mom in front of the clinic? Tomorrow is her birthday. Great news. Of course, let Rose come. I'll instruct Maria to buy a beautiful cake. Eva pouted slightly. Dario, no need for cake. I've gained so much weight. The cake is not for you, it's for mom. But will I be able to resist? It's better to ask Leonardo to buy mom some flowers. She loves lilies. This conversation took place in Dario's office, and the banker immediately seated his wife in a chair. When they decided on the gift, the man decided to give the order to his driver personally. Darling, wait here for a while. I'll send Leonardo to get the flowers. I'll be back soon and we'll have lunch together. Dario closed the door behind him and Eva hurried to the safe. She had noticed earlier that the main vault's door was slightly ajar. Time was scarce, but she had a rough idea of what she wanted to find. The thin file with a copy of Perez's will was at the very bottom, under a pile of papers. There were also some old black and white photographs. On one of them, the girl recognized her mother. Next to her stood a young man. Eva whispered. So, I resemble my father more. In the distance, she heard familiar footsteps and hurriedly returned the documents to their original place. She jumped into the chair and stared out of the window with an indifferent expression. Dario looked closely at his wife. Everything all right? Yes, my dear. I feel perfectly fine and I can already imagine how happy mom will be that we didn't forget her birthday. Rose arrived for lunch. Eva hadn't seen her mother with such a beautifully styled hairdo and dressed up for a long time. The woman was just as elegant as her appearance. Eva couldn't hide her admiration. Mom, you look absolutely stunning. Once a year, you can allow yourself a little indulgence. After all, that's what birthdays are for, right? Isn't that right, Dario? The son-in-law smiled and handed her a bouquet of white lilies, kissing her hand. I'm proud to have such a wonderful mother-in-law. I wish you continue to captivate male gazes. Now, excuse me, but I have to leave. But don't hesitate, Rose, make yourself at home. And when you decide to return home, just let Leonardo know. After the banker left, the women remained silent for a few minutes. Rose was the first to break the silence. My dear, I understood right away. Eva made a fearful expression, and her mother fell silent. 
Eva gestured towards the camera hanging from the ceiling and loudly said, Mommy, let's have tea and cake now, but first, let's go wash our hands. Come, I'll show you where the bathroom is. In the restroom, Eva turned on the tap. Mom, there's a napkin in the bouquet's packaging. On it, there's a sketch of Gonzalez's property. We'll have tea, and at 2 o'clock, Estella will call you, and you'll loudly say it's time to go. I marked the door on the plan, which is my escape route. Let Federica wait for me by the road. Eva rushed to hug her mother and burst into tears. Mommy, what a fool I've been. I'm so scared. I'm afraid I won't make it. Dario plans to send me to the clinic. If that happens, there will be big trouble for sure. Calm down, my dear. It's all my fault. I should have told you about your father earlier. But I was ashamed. Okay, we'll have time to talk more later. Don't delay, try to leave this dreadful house as soon as possible. Yes, mommy. I want to try tonight. Dario went to Italy for business. And I've already thought everything through. A suspicious rustle was heard behind the door, and Eva gladly repeated yesterday's trick. However, this time the housekeeper had learned from her previous mistake and managed to dodge in time. The tea is ready. Would you like some fruit as well? Eva grumbled in dissatisfaction. Maria, do we really need to clarify such trivial matters? The woman hurried to the kitchen, while Rose looked at her daughter with admiration. For almost an hour, mother and daughter chatted on unrelated topics. They purposely spoke loudly to lull the vigilance of any observers. When Leonardo arrived at the agreed time, Rose grabbed her bouquet and hurried to the car. Eva walked outside to see her mother off. The car slowly pulled out of the parking lot, and the girl watched it until it was out of sight. Mommy, until we meet again. Maria looked at Eva and smirked. She knew very well that this meeting was unlikely to happen. Before leaving for Italy, the owner had given her a special task that she was obliged to carry out. And the task was just the way Maria liked it. Keep a close eye on Eva, and if anything suspicious happens, report it immediately. Dario understood that there were only two months left until the birth. Much was at stake, and he didn't intend to jeopardize what he already considered his own due to some minor slip-ups. He often thought that his uncle Felipe had played himself. Could he have imagined that his quirk with the inheritance would ultimately benefit Gonzalez, the person he had first defrauded and then sent to the other world? Maria did her best. She couldn't stand the owner, but he paid her very well. She couldn't stand Eva even more than the owner. In fact, if she were to be honest, Maria couldn't stand anyone at all. All people were detestable to her. She believed that everyone, absolutely everyone, deserved punishment. Eva knew that her husband could return home either as soon as he finished his business or stay in Italy longer. But in any case, he wouldn't arrive before midnight. She couldn't miss this opportunity. Eva understood that Maria was abnormal and could lie and wait at her door, just to report her every move to the owner. There was no time to waste. Tomorrow, Dario would be back, and he would send her to the clinic. They would keep her there until the birth, and then, most likely, she would die during childbirth. Or rather, everyone would think she died because of that reason. Eva was preparing for bed, and Maria keenly observed everything she did. I'll go get some fresh air. It's good for sleep. The housekeeper made a face but began dressing up as well. Maria, where are you going? Or do you think I can't handle it on my own? The maid didn't respond. It was already chilly outside. Eva spotted Isidro in the distance, clearing the pathways. She headed towards him, and Maria followed. The young woman knew that Maria would listen to every word she said, so she intentionally spoke loudly. Isidro, do you ever get a break? He threw a quick glance at Maria, who stopped nearby, and answered just as loudly, they're forecasting a snowfall tonight. I decided to clear the paths now so they don't get covered. Help me distract Maria for a few minutes. In an hour. She was sure that Isidro understood everything correctly and cheerfully said. Ah. Too bad I can't help. 
I would have cleared the paths too. The housekeeper chuckled and headed back to the house, walking slowly as if taking a leisurely stroll and constantly glancing back at Eva. But the young woman had already conveyed the most crucial information. Approximately an hour later, a loud crash was heard outside. Eva and Maria rushed out to the street simultaneously. The housekeeper turned to her. Immediately go back inside, I'll check what's going on. Eva feigned innocence and extended her arm. But I also want to see. Go back inside, or I'll call Dario. Reluctantly, Eva headed towards the house. As soon as the housekeeper turned the corner, Eva ran through the pathways. She knew exactly where to go to avoid the cameras. One turn of the key, and Eva turned and locked the gate. There would be no traces inside as Isidro had just passed this path with his shovel. And outside the gate. She had some time before they realized. Maria returned home after ten minutes. Eva was nowhere to be found. She searched all the rooms on foot and then ran through them, but nothing. She dashed to the yard and realized that she had been shamelessly deceived. The woman grabbed her phone. She escaped, she's nowhere to be found. I'm nearby. Where should I look? He grabbed his laptop, which he always carried with him to check on what his wife was doing at any time. He scrolled through the footage until he caught a glimpse of the edge of Eva's coat on one of the cameras. He immediately told Leonardo, we need to go to the forest. She left through the back gate. But where can she go? The road is far from there. Listen, if she freezes and the baby isn't born, it'll be very bad. Come on, let's hurry. But Leonardo drove cautiously. Firstly, it was snowing heavily, and visibility was poor. Secondly, the road had turned into ice, sprinkled with snow. And thirdly, he was sure that a helpless pregnant Eva wouldn't be able to go far. Dario scolded him several times, then said, Stop. Tomorrow you'll go for driving lessons again. Let me drive. Leonardo moved to the passenger seat and buckled up. At this moment, he knew perfectly well that he couldn't defy the owner. They raced through the blanket of snow. Leonardo wanted to close his eyes because it was terrifying. And suddenly, Dario shouted, Look, there they are. Two people were running through the field. Eva and some other guy. They had about 15 meters left to reach their car, while Dario was a kilometer away from them because the road circled a large pond. They were on one side, and Eva's companion was on the other. There, on the road, stood a car that they didn't recognize and wouldn't notice. Federico accelerated from a standstill. Eva was crying and saying, They will catch up with us. We're doomed. Federico, please, save us. Save me and the baby. Federico didn't say anything. He confidently drove the car. He knew this road inside out and was familiar with all its twists and turns. His car was much lighter, so he could easily maneuver where a heavy SUV wouldn't be able to pass. But Federico made a mistake. The large black car caught up with them with certainty. If they tried to escape onto the main road, Federico and Eva wouldn't stand a chance because the other car had much more power. Surprisingly, the main road was quite busy. Federico suddenly remembered it was Friday. Everyone was in a hurry to leave the city. Eva fell silent. She simply watched the car that was relentlessly tailing them. The car behind them lightly nudged their vehicle. Federico struggled to stay on the road and cursed. Eva started crying quietly again. And then, the unexpected happened. Federico noticed that the oncoming truck was starting to slide. At that speed, he closed his eyes for half a second. Either way, if that other car caught them, and it would, they wouldn't survive. Federico floored the gas pedal, and the car made a desperate leap forward. Dario, absorbed in the chase, didn't immediately understand why the small car had suddenly accelerated. But when he realized, it was too late. Federico and Eva narrowly squeezed past the trailer that was slowly blocking the road. Dario managed to raise his hands and shout. Federico cautiously brought the car to a stop. Eva stared at him with huge eyes. 
Federico. Shh. Be quiet. I'll go check. He got out of the car, and Eva followed. I'm coming with you. Eva. No, I have to see this. I have to know what happened to him. They slowly approached the long trailer, where Dario's car was almost flattened. Some man blocked their path. Where are you dragging the pregnant woman? The scene is not for the faint of heart. That's my husband in there. Eva's eyes flashed with a cold gleam. Federico looked at her with surprise. He had never seen this side of Eva before. She walked up to the car, peering at what was left of it. It was as if she wanted to reassure herself that everything was okay, and that she had nothing to fear. Then she turned away and felt sick. Federico rushed to her side. Eva, let's go. Let's get out of here. She held her hands protectively over her belly. To the hospital. I need to go to the hospital. While they were driving, Eva seemed to be deeply focused on something. Once they were at the hospital, she said, Please, find Luca for me. The same Luca? Yes, as soon as possible. Tell him that Dario is dead. I need to talk to him. But... Federico, I beg you. My future, your future, and all of us depend on this. All right. She lay alone in the hospital room. The door creaked softly. Luca stood at the threshold, studying her with his gaze. Why do you need me? Eva sat up. To talk. I don't think we have any common topics for conversation. We do. He took a seat. Well, I don't know, and I don't want to know what kind of business you and my husband were involved in. I don't know how to run a bank, and I never wanted to, but I'm not stupid to not realize that my husband was involved in something not entirely honest. Eva spoke while looking straight ahead. I want to give you the bank and everything else you were involved in, in exchange for a peaceful life for me and my child. My child and me. Luca raised an eyebrow. And will you really do that? Yes. He got up and walked to the window. You're smarter than I thought. You've realized that they won't let you use all of that properly anyway. I agree. Moreover, keep the house and all the money in your husband's accounts. After all, it's still his child. He headed towards the door but stopped. For the first time, Eva saw a human look in his eyes. And one more thing. Don't be afraid of anyone anymore. No one will ever touch you. He closed the door firmly behind him. Eva leaned back on the pillow and finally cried with relief. By morning, she gave birth to a baby boy. They stayed in the hospital for about a month. The investigator came five times, and Luca called once. He said that they buried Dario and Leonardo properly. From the maternity ward, Eva was taken home by Estella, her mother, and Federico. Federico held the baby. Eva hugged everyone tightly. Oh, God, please forgive me. Forgive me, I was such a fool. I'm so happy that I can hug you all again. After inheriting, Eva had to meet Luca once more. They signed the papers, and the woman stood up. Am I free now? Luca smirked. Of course. Just so you know, I would never have thought of doing what your husband did. So, goodbye. Eva quickly left. He might not have thought of it, but she felt like a mouse next to that man. She had to go to the house to sort something out. Now she was a wealthy lady. Lawyers were already preparing the documents to recognize her son as Felipe's grandson. Federico opened the heavy door. Please come in. She took a few steps and suddenly waved her arms. Isidro, the gardener, quickly approached them. Thank God, you're all safe. Maria ran away, taking valuables from the house. I don't know whether to keep an eye on it or let it go. Isidro, forget about the valuables. The most important thing is that we are all alive. He almost teared up but still asked. What will happen to the house now? 
Eva shrugged. Honestly, I don't know yet. I don't want to live here, but the house is very nice and convenient. She wandered through the rooms for a while, then settled into a chair by the fireplace. Federico observed her. What are you thinking, Eva? I'm thinking that such a house should be inhabited by a big family, with children, grandparents, guests, and friends. Well, then what's the problem? Make it exactly that way. Eva laughed. It's easy to say. But don't forget that I'm a widow, and having many children is unlikely. Federico smiled. I can help with that. Eva raised an eyebrow. How? Marry me, I still love you just the same. She looked at him attentively. But I rushed into marriage, chased after money. I hurt you. So what? Can't love overcome that? A second later, Eva threw herself into his arms. Forgive me. Only you would risk everything for me. They had to wait a whole year not to arouse too much interest among people before getting married. And only then did they finally tie the knot. This time, Eva's mother and Estella declared, there will be a wedding, and indeed, there was one. Isidro was an honored guest at the wedding. Even Luca sent a bouquet. Eva, happy and beautiful, stood next to Federico, thinking that she shouldn't try to deceive destiny, it would flick her on the nose and set everything as it was meant to be. Apparently, Federico was her destiny all along, and she just hadn't noticed it. The woman lovingly looked at her now husband. Federico. He immediately turned towards her. Yes? I love you. He froze for a moment, then pulled her close. I thought I would never hear those words. Eva laughed. You know, I just realized that these words were always inside me. I just couldn't say them for some reason. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.